very much. Um, I have a couple of points of clarity to begin with. Um, you do have my recently published article that does go into philanthro capitalism as a theoretical background and agroecology. But I will not be talking about the theories here. I want to spend time on the farmer's practices. But there's a theoretical base. And quickly, in one sentence, my article on my research on philanthro capitalism is proposing, is suggesting that it's replacing neoliberalism. We have um, expressed neoliberalism for 35 years, critiqued it. And I think we as scholars need to start questioning what's finally replacing it. And that's the philanthro capitalism. And then, as you probably all know in the room here, agroecology is a different theoretical base um, to farming, to farming systems. Another point of clarity, and it should be part of the subtitle, but titles can get too long. My experience is limited to Southern Africa. Um, I know nothing about Northeast Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, although you probably know that a very definite hotspot for biodiversity is Ethiopia. Um, I've only experienced a little bit West Africa, but you probably know that Narika, one of the prominent rice strains, is being developed in West Africa. So the title should be Lessons from Southern Africa rather than my idea of generalizing to the whole continent. Um, my, for those of you, um, my, most of my time has been in Zimbabwe, but I've worked throughout the region in Mozambique and Zambia, in Tanzania and Botswana, Namibia, Swaziland. For political reasons, I've never worked in Angola, if you know the history of the US in Angola. Um, so I do consider myself a regionalist, but very limited to the southern part of the continent. And then I wanted to ask, how many of you among the students have you been to the continent? OK, where have you been? Tanzania, good. OK. In the back, there were several hands. Yes. Ghana, good. Ethiopia. Senegal, fantastic. Um, and so we, I really want you to critique the kinds of lessons I'm giving from your perspective. And my other question is, how many of you eat food? <laughs> OK. So even if you perhaps haven't been on the continent, um, what the kinds of questions I'm raising are very relevant to each one of us for that. And then quickly, Community Technology Development Trust is an NGO in Zimbabwe. This is one of my colleagues, one of my teachers. Um, he's a <clears throat> PhD seed breeder from UC Davis, but he spends all his time in the rural area um, of Zimb rural areas of Zimbabwe. He's holding two strains of sorghum, which he has bred, and I'll go into that in, in, uh, later on in the talk. So this is Professor Joseph um, Mushonga. And we all call him Joe. OK, now the outline um, is another clarity, the final clarity. Um, uh, because of time, and again, because of your backgrounds, because I know a lot of you have a background in agriculture, I'm going to be very simplistic about the ca characteristics of industrial agriculture. I know you often hear the positives of it. And I'm going to spend some time on the negatives of it, so understanding that it's simply setting a bit of a background. And then the other background is the context. I think when we're talking about food and food systems, we have to at least remember the context of the gross inequalities globally and then among ourselves. And the third part where I'm spending most of the time is on the farmers' alternatives, the smallholder farmers from Southern Africa. And quickly let me say I'm talking about one to five hectares. 100 hectares is large in southern Africa. If you have 1,000, it's very large. And as you know, for Iowa or Nebraska or the Dakotas, if you have several hundred thousand, it's still small. So by small, I mean one to five hectares. The first critique I have of industrial agriculture is the economies of scales. We even sing a song in the United States to the waving fields of grain. And what I'd like to suggest is by the 21st century, 
This is a picture of paucity, of genetic poverty, not of something to sing songs to. Why? Well, because the industry develops one seed to sell to millions, and then therefore the monoculture is not just in the picture you see of one species, wheat, but one variety of species. And then there's genetic paucity within the variety. It's called plasticity, very, very low genetic plasticities. So there's three monocultures in this picture. This is not the future of food. This is the past. Another critique of industrial agriculture is the consolidation. I was thinking I should have changed this slide because this is not really a market when only four corporations control almost 60% of the market share in each one of these huge agricultural sectors. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that it hasn't got anything to do with country. It really is about big corporations. Some are Swiss, some are French, some are German. And yes, of course, the US is there. So the idea that um, you have a corporate um, control of a market, and we call it what in economics? Oligopoly. So this is not a competitive market in any sense. And then finally, the most important one of the three is the critique that American industrial agriculture is now breeding for profit. They call it yield, and it is the huge success of the 20th century. Yield, yield, yield. And maybe we can all say we're in this room right now because we had sufficient food. That was a good agenda for the 20th century. But we're in the 21st century, and in order to have this quantity of food production that brings profit, they had to move to the monoculture. And in order to move the monoculture, the three kinds, you have to manufacture nature. And you've seen that if you've been to the Midwest anywhere on a large farm. They're manufacturing the soil. They're directing the water. They're manufacturing the bionome by the pesticides and the herbicides. And they're manufacturing the seed. So the 20th century, large quantity, but manufactured. And why? Because right now the US industry is feeding Wall Street, not people. We can talk about that more later. One statistic I can give you, 2017, 40% of the US corn harvest goes to ethanol. 40% is feeding cars. Another 33% is feeding cattle. You could say that's an indirect food for Americans, but it's also not a good indirect. So we're talking about monoculture that manufactures nature in order to make more profit for Wall Street and is no longer feeding people as the majority. Who are we talking about? Um, I've been researching Agra since its inception, since the end of 2006 and they now have many partners. AGRA is Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa that's funded by the Bill Gates Foundation, and the Warren Buffett Foundation gave billions to um, Bill Gates for this about five years ago. But it has very many partners. Certainly the US government, certainly the G8, which are the top industrialized countries such as the UK and Germany, the World Economic Forum just met in Davos um, in Switzerland, certainly the World Bank and the global seed corporations. One of the things I want you to notice is the extent of the power here. It's foundations, it's corporations, it's governments, it's international finance. It's overwhelming in terms of that. And the one symbol I'll use, again, I'm simplifying because I want to talk about the farmers, is the World Economic Forum came up with the word food value change. We need to link African farmers to the global food value chain. 
And what you'll hear in response from the farmers is we hear the word chain. So the, um, to move to the second context is the inequality that we're facing globally as well as within our countries and it's increasing. And I know you've had this in almost every class. I hope you've had it in almost every class. It's almost an old story. So what kind of inequality is affecting you? I'll start with the easy one, student debt. <laughs> what else is affecting you personally of the glowing, growing inequality? Any other ideas? Gender? <laughs> Ethnicity? Your choice of careers, larger choice in careers, perhaps, if you're at Cornell, than if you're at Northern Arizona University. It's an old story, OK? It's an old story. But we do have to set the context, because AGRA is very much related to the billions of dollars. Uh, we now hear he's worth about $100 billion. Um, Bill Gates, Bezos, and he trade turns. I think Bezos at top now. <laughs> and depending on how their portfolio goes, they're the richest or not the richest, OK? Um, so it's an old story, and I hope you are getting it in every class. It is the context for agra, for the kind of agriculture that's being promoted around the world. But I would like to talk about other kinds of inequality that are, to me, more important even, and certainly very much part of what we are looking at. How often do we hear that 98% of the food crops on, in sub-Sahara Africa are by family farmers? And this is an agra statistic. Who's feeding the African continent? 90% of all African farmers are smallholders. And for them, I think they go to um, under 10 hectares, but it's still minuscule compared to Iowa or, or South Dakota. 80% okay. of the seed on the African continent are provided by farmers to each other, sometimes in small markets, most of the time, and I'll be going into that, by free exchange, by sharing. That is the history of agriculture freely sharing your seeds. And it's not necessarily going to mean that we're not going to have a rural livelihood problem on the continent in 2050. In other words, because of population increase, because there are no jobs in the city, and if you are getting six figures, I know some of you are looking at jobs right now, you still might be sitting in a cubicle facing a computer screen. That's pretty boring. And you still might be putting in 12-hour days. So another thing that I'm going over too quickly we can discuss is the drudgery of smallholder farmer labor. But again, in the 21st century, it's a different talk when we're talking about many, many millions and millions unemployed in the cities. And then if you are one of the few in a shining skyscraper, you're still looking at a cubicle and still have no power. How would Agra look at this? How would Agra look at these statistics? A huge, beautiful, delicious, untapped market. The farmers are growing food, but they're not buying our seeds. And so this is a frontier, an economic frontier for the big seed corporations that I showed you, and for AGRA, and from the perspective of US government policy. It's not just the US. I speak of the US because I'm American. So we could, you know, we could throw in the Swiss. Uh, we could throw, throw in the Germans. But I'll keep it with, with my particular country. And then another kind of inequality. The African continent has not lost its smallholder farmers. They are the basis of biodiversity. We are down to 12 plants, and we're sick. 
And believe me, the rest of the world notices we're sick. We're not only sick from the pesticides and the fertilizers, but we're sick from the genetic po paucity or the low plasticity of the seed. And we're sick because we're down to 12 plants. Uh, let me name the first easy one, corn. Name the next four or five, somebody. Corn, what are our 12 plants in the US? Wheat, rice. Beans, uh, not so much uh, sugar beets for our sugar, okay? And soya, the big one that's been genetically modified. So the, the, the and then potatoes also. So the wheat, um, corn, and soya are the big three, and then there's the rest. When we're down to 12 plants, we haven't got much nutrition in our food, okay? Sorry. So what I'm now switching to is the people whom I think are much more important than Bill Gates, the smallholder African farmers, who are saying to Bill Gates, uh, we understand the kinds of things that you're trying to bring to the continent. And we're not just resisting, you'll notice in my title, the title is alternatives. So we actually already have alternatives. And that's how we're going to respond to you. And the ways they're doing it, and I'm going to be uh, spending time on this, is through participatory plant breeding, seed banks, community seed banks, and then the farmer field schools. And why? Because their goal, and here the difference, is not so much quantity. And let's, let's you know, pat American industry on the back. That's good. Quantity is not such a big issue as it was earlier. But the biodiversity of food is, given what? Climate change and nutrition. So it's a different goal than, than just quantity, and they're trying to achieve it in these ways. So let me spend a few minutes on each of these. The first one of participatory plant breeding. The smallholder farmers will get together in workshops. They generally last a week, five days, five working days. And they're doing things like, at the very bottom first, choosing the species and the variety that they would like to breed in different ways. There's sacred seeds. And those sacred seeds aren't on the selection list to par do participatory plant breeding. I come from northern Arizona. The Hopi people are an hour from my, my house. There's no way Hopi would do any kind of plant breeding for blue maize, for blue corn. It is so sacred to the Hopi. Well, it's the same with indigenous farmers everywhere. They have seeds that are not commodities. They may be food, but the Hopi actually see their blue maize as their children. And as you know, that's Mayan from Guatemala has moved up into Southwest. So the varietal selection is important. They pick and choose. Okay, there's this strain of sorghum or that strain of pearl millet, and we'll, we'll do that. And then they practice and learn new techniques to enhance that environment in uh, variety. So when you hear agar referred to old seeds, what are they talking about? Farmers are improving their varieties all the time, or they would have starved to death thousands of years ago. So to allow agra to have the word improved seeds belong only to agra. Sorry, wrong. If you want to talk about the incre incredible diversity of seeds, it's the farmers who have improved seeds constantly. Selected, not all of them. Some of the strains are weak, and they may stay that way. But it's the farmers' choices, which of the varieties are staying weak and which they're enhancing. And it is to improve the vigor of the seed and to improve its genetic composition. 
they'll bring in their own seed and share it. And then the sharing of the, uh, the germplasm of the seed is a way to increase breeding. And all of this increases biodiversity. All of this increases biodiversity. So this is a picture of um, a sorghum that Joe Mushonga bred as a PhD breeder. And the reason it has the little owls, the little hairs, is because sorghum is an exposed grain and the quail birds go, yes, a, a feast. Um, if you're part of, in part, from a, a part of Southern Africa that grows sorghum, you know that. So it's considered too labor intensive. It's considered a coarse grain in British English. Well, it's because the British didn't eat sorghum. So they bred the little hairs on the sorghum to deter the birds. And then they're planting the sorghum at different times. So your sorghum crop doesn't disappear with one arrival of birds. This was bred by a scientific PhD seed breeder and has been developed by participatory plant breeding. I'm trying to say we need both. We need both. So participatory plant breeding is a technical solution to sustain biodiversity, especially during climate change. Who's out in the fields noticing everything blowing away? Who's out in the fields noticing uh, that the sun's too strong? The farmers. And it's also a political act of resistance and alternatives. Participatory plant breeding. The second way they're doing it is community seed banks. And yes, it's this modest and this small. Small containers, and this is where an NGO comes into play. They help purchase some of the canisters. But the farmers choose who's a member of the community seed bank. They elect the organizers of the community seed bank. They build the small building, which is half the size of this room. And the outsider just provides a little bit. The farmers also decide what seeds come in here. Again, it's not all seeds. And there is no community seed bank that I know in Southern Africa that has any varieties coming from the corporations. These are all what we call farmer's seeds. So they do use hybrid maize. And that's got another whole history, and we can talk about that. But they won't bring the hybrid maize here. They will bring the sorghums and the millets into the community seed banks. And that's what this shows. This is only Zimbabwe, I'm sorry, but it is where I have some, some solid data. So if you talk about cow peas, which are black-eyed peas, bombara nuts, which grow under the ground, like our, what we call peanuts and ground nuts, 35% of the accessions in the community seed bank have a lot of protein. Then you can see the grains, the sorghum and the millets, 48%. Sorghum and millet are much, much more nutritious, and, and all of that's documented, than maize or rice. It has a, they have a lot of mineral nutrients in them. And then you can see 12% is traditional maize. Um, and I can use this, sorry, right there, OK? Um, but it's traditional, and that's kind of a misnomer, because as you know, maize came from where? Oaxaca, Mexico. Okay, The genetic origin of maize is, is uh, southwest Mexico. So it's traditional, meaning it's been there several centuries. And then the final one um, are a few vegetables. Um, that's only uh, 5%. Okay? But you see right here, and this is, this is in, it's not one seed bank, it's the ones in Zimbabwe. You have nutrition, you have high protein, you have low fat, high minerals, you have carbohydrates, and low sugar. So this is what the farmers are choosing to conserve under their feet in their villages. Their objectives are really easy and something that we should try to remember. Conserve, multiply, and share. And the thing that's really different about seeds, it's very much close to knowledge, not, not like cash. If I have cash and I give it to you, 
It's a zero-sum game. I've lost it. If I have knowledge and share it, we all multiply it. The seeds multiply, flourish, are conserved only if they're shared. If we lock them up and slabbard up in northern Norway, we've lost them. We have to have the knowledge and the sharing. And then the final goal is to strengthen the farmer's integrated seed systems. And then the third and final way are farmer field schools, is how they're offering alternatives to industrial agriculture on the African continent. And there are um, participatory plant breeding, community seed banks, and farmer field schools throughout the continent. And I hope you all have experienced in the countries that you know. So the farmer field schools are what they say they are. And this is a picture of one of them. And your reaction is, oh yeah, granny. <laughs> and he's one of the participants. And I bet you he can download rap music uh, record for record for you, okay? He is a farmer, a peasant, and a participant in farmer field schools, okay? So watch how we tend to look at this picture. A bunch of old barefoot, maybe a little bit flip-flops, getting dirty in goat manure and cow manure, yeah. And by the way, that's a lot healthier than glyphosate, <laughs> okay? <laughs> glyphosate, you might not get quite as dirty, but it's a lot healthier. And these are also participants. And the farmer field schools um, have a particular also goals. They get together about once a week, sometimes once every two weeks. They plan ahead, so they'll have maybe the next five sessions planned ahead of, okay, we want to discuss this, we want to discuss that. But then a big storm comes in and ruins something, and they change the topic of discussion. In other words, everyone's free to come. Everyone can participate. The widows are honored because they do have knowledge. But the younger folk might have more formal education, more scientific knowledge. So they're also very much sharing. And they're not just sharing the school knowledge. And this is another place where we have to change our thinking. They're sharing indigenous knowledge. And that indigenous knowledge is as scientific and as results-based proven as anything you're going to get in your lab. It's a different way of results-based because you don't have the control factors that you have in a laboratory. But watch it if we professors, and I mean me, tell you the only way to have a scientific experiment is in a highly controlled lab. No, there's other approaches to science than just a controlled lab. We need the controlled lab. We really do. And then I'll show you why we need them. Well, I can show you right here. See the tables? The one table, you can see about 20 plates, sometimes a bit more than 20. Those crops come from one hectare. It's what we call nutrition density. So if you change the measure from quantity, how many kilograms per hectare to be a successful farmer, to how much nutrition do you have on a hectare, who wins? The grandmas with the young folk joining them. And that's what I'm suggesting is part of the 21st century, the future of food. It's the nutrition density. So I'm an academic. I sit in a cubicle called an office. So um, four NGOs got together. They got money from Europe. And it's we're in our third year, so I'll let you know in a few months what the results are. Instead of letting Carol Thompson sit in her cubicle and decide what nutrition density is, that sounds sexy, <laughs> we sent it back to the farmers. So farmers in Southeast Asia, in South America, and in Africa are working on, and it's a three-year project, are working on coming back to us and saying, well, here's what we mean by nutrition density in the field. 
And then the second part, which was added, is, and here's what we mean by nutrition density on our supper table. And then the farmers are going to come back and, and tell the academics who sit in cubicles whether it really is a concept and that can be turned into a measure. And that's really key. We don't, we don't know yet. So the goals are what I keep saying, to solve agronomic problems, to increase seed diversity, nutrition diversity, and that means our food, and then to sustain the local uh, farmers, to, to sustain the farming systems. Conserve, multiply, share. And I do have to stop here and point out to you, I haven't mentioned the word patent or intellectual property right <laughs> or privatization. They don't do that. And they don't do it in the face of that corporate power I showed you in the early slide. No patenting on seed. It's universal across the African continent. They brought it to the Seattle World Trade Organization, universal across the continent. And the US government kicked it off the agenda. Didn't even get spoken about in the World Trade Organization. And yeah, 1999, I was in the streets in Seattle, but I had three Southern African farmers with me, so it was delightful. <laughs> so they're not privatizing their knowledge. Knowledge is expand by sharing it. And there's all kinds of ways to privatize knowledge, so watch it. The patent is just the quick and dirty way. And Monsanto has found it's uh, pretty expensive and totally miserable to enforce. <laughs> so they're finding new ways to privatize, not the smallholder farmers. It is an alternative that increases genetic wealth, not dissipates it. So the summary slide, they offer alternatives to industrial agriculture through decentralization. The villages are in control, and it varies. In a large village in Zimbabwe, it might be one village. In another place in Zimbabwe, it might be three villages. They participate, and boy, do they debate. <laughs> this is not like, oh, we all agree here. No, it's like, hey, my field was just flooded, and yours wasn't now. What do we do? OK? So it's really exciting. And the one I want to emphasize is they're increasing genetic wealth for the rest of us. How? Through participatory plant breeding, community seed banks, and farmer field schools. The goal, the biodiversity, biodiversity of food. And let me offer another one in summary by working with nature, not manufacturing nature. So the 20th century was manufacturing nature. Thank you, we have food quantity. The 21st century is to work with nature because in climate change, we need the biodiversity to survive. When a sorghum hits the dust because of what, well, the big example for Southern Africa, when maize hits the dust, which it has, because there's drought, they have their sorghum and their millets, their cassava, their sweet potatoes, and they don't starve. They ain't got no maize. But if the US government only counts maize, they'll tell you once again that Southern Africa is starving. So challenge back to us, and this is how I'm finishing so we can have a debate. They've asked me to ask you, what are you guys doing to help change perspectives, to help build the future of food? And these are obviously my academic categories. Our views of identity. You probably have identity, identity, identity in every class. Gender, ethnicity. How about peasants? When I say the word peasant, what do you think? Watch it. Notice that you do. Concepts. You got at the beginning, you can't call an oligopoly the market. Even if you put global food value chain in front of it. Don't let the professors call everything the market. No, if it's an oligopoly, it ain't a market, okay? 
It violates all of the assumptions by all the neoclassical economists about what a market is. The other one, oh, these farmers are barefoot and, and carry manure. They're subsistent. The statistic I have for you, again, from Zimbabwe, but it certainly could happen in Senegal, uh, Ghana, so maybe we can get Ghana. Um, from the Zimbabwean smallholder farmers who are doing the three participatory plant breeding community seed banks, farmer field schools, last year, 2017, they produced eight tons of peanuts, nine tons of pearl millet, and 10 tons of sorghum that were um, that solved commercial uh, quality testing, and they sold it on the small local commercial market. So they do have certified seed. It goes well beyond the farm gate. It just doesn't get to maybe Cape Town, <laughs> okay? It gets to the local area. Those are markets. They're not closed systems. They're open systems. And then efficiency, I'll let that one sort of sit because I want to get to your talk. So help me in our discussion think of more concepts you and I need to change right here in the universities in order to hear what the farmers are saying. Then the scientific method I mentioned briefly, the place where scientific high-tech seed breeders, and that very much includes genetically modified, fail is in the field over and over and over again. So they have this highfalutin, high variety, genetically modified organism, take it to the farmer's field and <laughs> So the field testing has to be part of the development of even highly bred seed. And the farmers know that, and they would like some of these new seeds. I won't call them improved, I'll call them new. But the people making the new seeds think they can do it without the fields. And please do notice we're 25 years into GMOs. There's not one that is helping human health or human nutrition or has long-term yields. The yields are good from three to five years, depending on the species, and then down. What we have from GM is glyphosate and the loss of monarch butterflies, and the jury's still out on bees. The industry was correct that we can't prove it's adversely affecting Amer American health, American human health, because there was no control group. So those of us who were raising questions about GM have backed away and said, okay, discussion, we can't, we can't go there. We, we don't have the proof. We now have the proof on other species such as monarch butterflies to the extent that Monsanto has paid a few hundred million dollars uh, pocket change acknowledging that the widespread spraying of milkweeds has decimated the, the monarch population. But nothing coming from GMOs for human health or nutrition 25 years later. Units of analysis, I keep hearing, and I got this too, and I, fortunately I don't have to teach it. When you're doing regression analysis or when you're doing high level stats, you have to have an individual. You have to have number of cases. And if you go to the African continent and talk to individual farmers, <laughs> I have never met an individual farmer. They're based in their families, and then what I'm showing you, they're based in their communities. So it's a community of farmers. And that doesn't mean you don't maybe interview a few individuals, but you have to put the individuals in the context. And a lot of our highfalutin stats can't do that because it has to stay N equals whatever. So they're saying to us, wait a minute, don't, don't just talk to Carol or Susie or John. Come and join the group of community um, seed bank people and listen to all of us. And you'll see we don't agree. <laughs> and you'll see how we solve problems. That's very different than interviewing Carol and Susie and John. And then the final one, the most important. Let's change some measures. 
And no, we shouldn't get rid of quantity. We have to eat. <laughs> That's quantity. But can we add nutrition density as equally important? And my example for that, which you, I know you're getting in all your classes, and you could cite back to me, we used to just do GDP. Well, in the news still does just GDP, and you know, don't get me started to get what's wrong with GDP. But then we added HDI, Human Development Index, from the 1970s. It took, till, it took 20 years for that to sort of track. And now I think you kind of pay attention to both. GDP, HDI. I'm saying, hey, let's do the same. Quantity and nutrition density. And let's start working on it. Because it's our measures going into the US government, in the lab, if you are a scientist, um, in public policy, if you're more in my field, that are perpetuating the myopic 20th century view. And then finally, uh, the big one, success. If success is simply profit, you know, sorry, um, you haven't got the farmer's attention. And that goes back, and I'll finish with this, the five capitals. Profit is only finance. And I'm writing about how Bill Gates is in the family of seed, international seed banks, the 16 big seed banks, the CGRs. And Bill Gates has been in there since 2007. He revamped it from 2008 to 2010. And the only thing you see, and so please correct me if you can find it, I need it. The only thing you see for the CMETs, the ICRASATs, uh, the ERIES, if you know the seed banks, is cash accounting, finance capital. So when Bill Gates gives 10 million bucks, whew, he's a big contributor. So what I need your help in, because I can't find it, is some acknowledgement in 16 international seed banks, which are public, that there are 700,000 seeds in these seed banks, that there is an inventory in ICRASAT of sorghum and millets that's acknowledged. And we don't want a dollar amount on them, but we want acknowledgement of inventory. Why? because the 16 international seed banks exist because of the farmers. They brought the genetic wealth. It's a bank <laughs> because the farmers shared their seeds. And it ain't fair for Bill Gates to only count cash. And then he's even duplicitous because he's worth 100 billion, but he's after ge African genetic wealth. Because he knows very well, press a few computer keys, and 100 billion can boop, go away. If you have genetic wealth, you have the future of food. So if you find a seed bank acknowledging their inventory of genetic wealth, let me know. I can't find it. And I put this in because they're laughing with me. I don't know how to dance, <laughs> OK? <laughs> and they're not laughing at me. They're right. I don't know how to dance. <laughs> and what I'm suggesting is they could have the same attitude toward us with our academic knowledge. They need to laugh at us, or they'll cry. And we had all these are farmers. And you can see there are men in the background, uh, but the women were dancing. And I'm really no good at it. And then the divide, Zambia on the left, Zimbabwe on the right. This is below Victoria Falls, the Zambezi River. And I know I have presented to you a dichotomy. And that's too simplistic. But right now, that's about where we are with two farming systems. And then what I'm suggesting is you can zip line across and help us solve it. You can help us decide how to bridge that particular chasm, because it's really serious. And I'll end with, you can do it every single day by what you purchase. Quit buying corporate food. Buy local. Buy organic. And yes, it's more expensive, but you don't need this many strawberries. This many has more nutrition in it anyway. So no, forget Costco. 
go by local. You can do it every day. Zip line across the dichotomy. Thank you.